the American Exchange Bank Robbery. Part 1 of 5. Late in the afternoon of Friday, May 4, 1888, two messengers left the American Exchange National Bank, at the northeast corner of Cedar Street and Broadway, New York City, and started down the busy thoroughfare for the office of the Adams Express Company, a few blocks distant. They carried between them, each holding one of the handles, a valise made of canvas and leather, in which had just been placed, in the presence of the paying teller, a package containing $41,000 in greenbacks, to be transmitted to the United States Treasury in Washington for redemption. Although the messengers, Edward S. Crawford and Old Dominie Earl, were among the bank's most trusted employees, their honesty being considered above suspicion, they were nevertheless followed at a short Distance by bank detective McDougall, an old-time police detective, whose snow-white beard and ancient style of dress have long made him a personage of note on Broadway. Detective McDougall followed the messengers, not because he had any fear that they were planning a robbery, but because it is an imperative rule of all great banking institutions that the transfer of large sums of money, even for very short distances, shall be watched over with the most scrupulous care. Each messenger is supposed to act as a check on his fellow, while the detective walking in the rear is a check on both. In such cases all three men are armed, and would use their weapons without hesitation should an attack be made upon them. The messengers walked on through the hurrying crowd, keeping on the east sidewalk as far as Wall Street, where they turned across, and continued their way on the west sidewalk as far as the Adams Express Companies building, which stands at No. 59 Broadway. Having seen them safely inside the building, the detective turned back to the bank, where his services were required in other matters. Passing down the large room strewn with boxes and packages ready for shipment, the two messengers turned to the right, and ascended the winding stairs that in those days led to the money department, on the second floor. No one paid much attention to them, as at this busy hour bank messengers were arriving and departing every few minutes. Still, some of the clerks remembered afterward, or thought they did, that the old man, Earl, ascended the stairs more slowly than his more active companion, who went ahead, carrying the valise alone. Both messengers, however, were present at the receiving window of the money department when the package was taken from the valise and handed. To the clerk, who gave a receipt for it in the usual form, received from the American Exchange Bank one package marked as containing $41,000, for transfer to Washington, or, at least, so far as has ever been proved, both messengers were present when the package was handed in. The two messengers, having performed their duty, went away, Earl hurrying to the ferry to catch a train out into New Jersey, where he lived, and Crawford returning to the bank with the empty valise. The valuable package had meantime been ranged behind the heavily wired grating along with dozens of others, some of them containing much larger sums. The clerks in the money department of the Adams Express Company become so accustomed to handling gold, silver, and banknotes, fortunes done up in bags, boxes, or bundles, that they think little more of this precious merchandise than they might of so much coal or bricks. A quick glance, a touch of the hand, satisfies them that the seals, the wrappings, the labels, the general appearance, of the packages are correct, and having entered them duly on the way bills and turned them over to the express messenger who is to forward them to their destination, they think no more about them. In this instance the $41,000 package, after a brief delay, was locked in one of the small portable safes, a score of which are always lying about in readiness, and was lowered to the basement, where it was loaded on one of the company's wagons. The wagon was then driven to Jersey City, guarded by the messenger in charge, his assistant, and the driver, all three men being armed, and was safely placed aboard the night express for Washington. It is the company's rule that the messenger who starts with a through safe travels with it to its destination, though he has to make a journey of a thousand miles. Sometimes the destination of money under transfer is so remote that the service of several express companies is required, and in that case the messenger of the Adams Company accompanies the money only to the point where it is delivered to the messenger of the next company, and so on. The next morning, when the package from the American Exchange Bank was delivered in Washington, the experienced Treasury clerk who received it perceived at once, from the condition of the package, that something was wrong. 
employees of the Treasury Department seem to gain a new sense, and to be able to distinguish bank notes from ordinary paper merely by the feel, even when done up in bundles. Looking at the label mark of $41,000, the clerk shook his head, and called the United States Treasurer, James W. Hyatt, who also saw something suspicious in the package. Mr. Blanchard, the Washington agent of the Adams Express Company, was summoned, and in his presence the package was opened. It was found to contain nothing more valuable than slips of brown straw paper, the coarse variety used by butchers in wrapping up meat, neatly cut to the size of bank notes. The $41,000 were missing. It was evident that at some point between the bank and the treasury a bogus package had been substituted for the genuine one. The question was, where and by whom had the substitution been made? The robbery was discovered at the Treasury in Washington on Saturday morning. The news was telegraphed to New York immediately, and on Saturday afternoon anxious councils were held by the officials of the American Exchange Bank and the Adams Express Company. Inspector Burns was notified, the Pinkerton Agency was notified, and urgent dispatches were sent to Mr. John Hoey, president of the Express Company, and to Robert Pinkerton, who were both out of town, that their presence was required immediately in New York. Meanwhile everyone who had had any connection with the stolen package, the paying teller of the bank, other bank clerks, the messengers, Detective McDougall, the receiving clerks of the Adams Express Company, and the Express Messenger, was closely examined. Where and how the $41,000 had been stolen was important to learn not only in itself, but also to fix responsibility for the sum lost as between the bank and the express company. Three theories were at once suggested – the bogus package might have been substituted for the genuine one either at the bank, between the bank and the express office, or between the express office and the treasury. The first assumption threw suspicion on some of the bank employees, the second upon the two bank messengers, the third upon someone in the service of the express company. Both the bank and the express company stoutly maintained the integrity of its own employees. <laughs>